Well, all right, let's take our Bibles. We're going to turn to the book of 1 Samuel this morning, the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 30 is where we are going to be. So 1 Samuel chapter 30 this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we're going to begin in verse number 1. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, and beginning in verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse number 1. Once you find it, if you would stand in reverence to God's Word this morning, as we read God's Word, if you're not, obviously, if you're not physically able to, then uh, you are welcome to just remain seated and follow along with us. 1 Samuel chapter 30, we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter 30, and beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says that it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but they carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city. Behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Would you read that last verse, verse number four, with me this morning out loud? Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Ever been there in your life where you just weep? And you have no more power to weep. I want to preach this morning on getting past our circumstances and our emotions. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do ask now that, Lord God, you would give this mouthpiece wisdom, eloquence, and Lord God, just the power of your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray now that you would just be with us. And again, Lord God, that we would be receptive to that which you have for us. If there's anyone here who's not saved, Lord, I pray that you would cause them to see their need, their greatest need this morning, their need of accepting Christ as personal Savior. And Lord God, as we deal with the grief of David and his men this morning, I do pray now that you would help us to apply it to our own lives. Lord, we're all going to find ourselves, and perhaps maybe there's some here this morning who are in this state of hopelessness and distress. And Father, I pray that this would be an encouragement. I pray that you would strengthen. We pray, Heavenly Father, for your spirit of comfort this morning to be greater than our hardship. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. David and his men have found themselves in quite a situation here. If you go to the previous chapter, and you don't have to, but if you go to the previous chapter, you will find that David and his men of war had to leave Ziklag. Ziklag was a city that had been given to them, but David and his men of war had to leave Ziklag because the Philistines were going to wage war with Israel, and the Philistines expected David and his men to go with them. And, of course, that's kind of a long story because you're wondering, well, why would David be going with the Philistines when he is an Israelite? Well, that's kind of why they are where they are in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Ziklag was a Philistine city, and it was a city that the king had given to David David, remember, is on the run from King Saul, and he's been on the run for a long time, and they were given Ziklag by the Philistines, but they had to leave Ziklag, and while they were gone, the Amalekites came and burned the city down and took, the, took all the women and children captive and took them with them, so that when David and his men came back to Ziklag, they found the city barren and burned down, and all their wives and their children had been carried away. 
And so now you can understand why verse number 4 says that they wept until they had no more power to weep. It's interesting to see how different men of God handled certain situations that came along in their lives and what it was that ultimately got them the victory. Too often we, we read the Bible for what, it, for, what it, for what we intend for it to be, but what it was never intended to be. The Bible is not for our entertainment. The Bible is not just a series of stories written to entertain us and perhaps give us some moral lesson. Oftentimes you'll hear Christians say, I don't read the Bible because I just find it too boring. But no one reads the maintenance manual for a vehicle because it's entertaining. They read it because it's helpful. They read it because it's vital. It's vital to the health of your vehicle if you're going to keep that vehicle, keep it healthy, keep it uh, beneficial to you, and keep it for a long time. Do you understand that the Bible is the manual to life? It's the manual to longevity. It's the manual to joy. People who have made that statement, I don't read the Bible because it's boring, they have completely missed the point. The Bible was not written for our entertainment. It was written for our instruction. Matter of fact, the Bible puts it this way. It was written for our admonition. And it was written for our example. That we might learn how we are to stand. The Bible is for our instruction. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, we read that we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. That's what the Word of God is for. That's what the Bible is for. And the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In a nutshell, this is why the Bible was written. Because it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. In other words, we're all going to stand before Almighty God, and God's going to judge us according to this manual of life right here. And the Bible says that if you study, you show yourself approved unto God as you stand before that judgment seat. And the workman, that is the person who read this book, studied this book, and applied this book, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We can stand before God resting on the laurels of this book right here. But mark my words, we will all stand before Almighty God one day. We flunk in life if we don't read the Word of God, learn from its lessons, and apply those lessons to our own lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 11, we read that all these things happened unto them for our ensamples, and they are written for our admonition. Boy, all the things that we are going through today as a society, we wouldn't have to be going through if we would just take God's Word, we would read God's Word, learn from God's Word, and apply God's Word because it's written for our admonition. When referring to the wisdom found in God's Word, the writer of the book of Proverbs said, Forsake her not. That is the wisdom of God's word. Don't forsake her. She shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Boy, you want to be kept in this life? Love the wisdom found in God's word. You want to be preserved in this life and in the life to come? Love the wisdom found in God's word. Proverbs 6.22 says, when thou goest, it shall lead thee. We don't have to walk through this life blind, wondering, where's this decision going to lead? And where is this decision going to lead? The Bible gives us instruction. The Bible gives us understanding. From raising children to who we ought to marry to how we ought to how we have to treat one another. 
The Bible gives us instruction. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. And when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. You want a good night's sleep? Live according to God's word. When thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. That's the first thing that you ought to be thinking about when you get up in the morning is God's word. What does God's word have for me today? What is God, how, where is God's word going to lead me today? When you take God's word, read it for what it is, and then apply it to your life. And by the way, I'm thankful because this instruct, instruction manual, though it does get tedious sometimes, Though it does get hard to take sometimes because I want to do one thing, but this instruction manual of life tells me I need to be doing something else. As a matter of fact, this instruction manual even tells me how to think and what to think about and what to think on. The best things, the things that are honest and the things that are true and the things that are full of virtue, those are the things that we are to think on. And when we do, man, all those things follow us. The Bible says, when thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. So when you take God's word and read it for what it is and then apply it to your life, it becomes very interesting and it becomes very personal. I am amazed that I can go back and read something that was written thousands of years ago and how it is so personal to me today. Even what we're reading about this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 30. This is another one of those times in the life of David where it seems as though there's no way out of the situation. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us concerning this situation, their attitude was that they, their voice wept, they lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Even his own friends, the Bible says, are about to turn against him. In verse number 6, David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. This is very interesting because these men had left everything to follow David, and they had been so loyal to David that they were ready to lay down their lives just so David could have some water. But now at this point, even David's men have gone against him. Well, how does David get out of this? There are three things I want us to look at from this particular situation in David's life. Actually, two things this morning. We're going to cover the last thing tonight. But uh, three things that I want us to look at in this particular situation in David's life that I think will help us because maybe you don't run a town like David did. But I guarantee you have felt about as helpless and hopeless as David is feeling at this point in his life. And so the first thing that I want you to look at this morning is let's look at this situation, the situation. In verse number 1 and 2, it gives us a great description of this situation. The Bible says it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. And Ziklag had, and, and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. And so as we look at this situation, one of the things that might have caused this situation to look hopeless to David was that this situation was kind of self-induced. Hey, have you ever been in a, in a situation in your life when, when you are down and, boy, you're just reaping the consequences of your own bad decisions? As a matter of fact, if we would be honest, I think every one of us would have to say, boy, I have been multitude of times in my life 
where I look around and things are not going very well, but I have no one to blame for myself because the situation I find myself in is self-induced. The situation I find myself in is a situation that I got myself into because of my own poor decisions. You know that we can look and blame the Amalekites, and we know the Amalekites were wicked people. But the situation David's in really is a situation that David made for himself. He was a leader, and therefore, he led his men into this situation. First of all, the first thing that led to the situation we find right here is the biggest mistake any man can make. David followed his heart. He followed his heart. Say, how so? Well, I want you to back up to 1 Samuel chapter 27 because we see what leads David to be living in Ziklag in the first place. In 1 Samuel chapter 27 and in verse number 1. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse number 1. Now, I want you to understand, David's life has been really rough over the last several years. Some estimate up to a decade and possibly more. Because David had to, well, David had to flee Israel. He had to flee Jerusalem. He had to flee the palace. Because David had been employed by King Saul, but David did such a good job that the people began singing songs about David. Right, David had slain Goliath, and David had won battles, and it got to the point where King Saul became so jealous of David that he tried to kill him on more than one occasion. Finally, David found he had no choice but to flee the palace, and David became public enemy number one. And so from that time on, David's been on the lamb. David's been in hiding. David has been public enemy number one. Saul has been chasing him. Saul's army has been chasing him. Saul has used all his resources. If Saul had the FBI, they were after him. If Saul had the CSI, they were after him. Or the CIA, they were after him. Everyone was after David. And so David had been living his life like this for some estimate over a decade. So finally, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 27, and in verse number 1, David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. Okay, now on the surface, that all sounds great. He's been running for his life. Now, for the, for the last uh, 10 years, and, and uh, I actually got to be in some of the places where David was fleeing and where David was camping and where he was living, there in En Gedi, is not a, it's not a great place to have to live your life. But it was, at the time, God's will for David. But David was listening to his heart now, and now he was disregarding God's advice and God's continued deliverance. You see, David, a few chapters earlier, had been advised to stay away from the Philistine territory after initially fleeing for his life to the Philistine territory. So, we need to back up a little bit further to see what leads to this. Um, keeping in mind in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse number 1, David said in his heart, I shall now perish, and now I need to go into the land of the Philistines. Let's back up to 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22, and this is all going to come together, I promise you. 1 Samuel chapter 22. See, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, David had run to Gath, to the king of Gath. 
By the way, if you're thinking Gath sounds familiar, it is, because not long before that, David had fought Goliath of Gath, the Philistine champion, and had killed him for Israel. Well, now David is on the outs with the king of Israel, and so he flees to Gath. Things don't work out too well for him in Gath. Then he goes to Moab, and he leaves his parents there in Moab. And in 1 Samuel chapter 22, and in verse number 5, 1 Samuel 22, verse number 5, David is given instruction from the man of God. The prophet Gad said unto David in 1 Samuel 22, verse number 5, The prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hold, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. Well, I know this doesn't make a whole lot of sense because David was an enemy in the land of Judah as far as the king was concerned. But it's where God told him to go. And so the Bible tells us that David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. But what was the instruction? Get back into the promised land. Get back into God's land. Stay away from the Philistines and stay out of Moab and, and, and stay out of these places where you think it's going to be safer. The safest place to be, the best place to be, is right smack in the middle of God's will. And sometimes God's will is going to seem like the worst place to be. Oftentimes I will sit with couples and I'll say, listen, God's will is reconciliation. And that couple are looking at each other and they're thinking to themselves, well, we, all we do is torture each other. How in the world could this be better? God's will is always better than being out of God's will. Right. And so David departed and went into the promised land. Was it easy? No, it was not easy. Was it fun? God's will is not always about being fun. It's always about a greater purpose. And that is to bring God glory and honor. And by the way, David would learn that eventually being in God's will is fun. But sometimes we got to go through the hard times. Hey, getting an education is not always fun. There are some parts of some parts of getting an education that are fun. I can remember as a kid, I loved the fun parts of education. People would ask me, what's your favorite class? Recess is my favorite class. What's your favorite thing about school? Recess is my favorite. Actually, no, that's my second favorite. Uh, the last bell is my favorite thing about school. It wasn't always fun. But I want to tell you something. I enjoy the ability to read. I enjoy the ability to write. I enjoy the ability to do basic math because I can't do much beyond that. But nonetheless, I enjoy the ability to do things. Getting an education, the result of an education is fun because it helps you to live life. However, the education itself, I didn't particularly enjoy. And I know some weird kids do enjoy that. They're the ones that are going to become, I don't know, uh, I'm not going to say anything <laughs> for fear that someone in here may have that occupation. So we'll just, we'll just stop right there. But as we look at David's situation, hey, he was told, stay in Judah. Stay away from the Philistines. Stay away from Moab. Don't stay in the hold. In 1 Samuel 22, verse number 5, Gad told him, go in to Jerusalem. Or not Jerusalem, but to Judah. And interesting, interesting enough, all the time David was there, it's true, Saul sought to kill him but he never got the chance. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse number 14, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 14, and 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 14, and David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand why because he was in God's will because he was where he was supposed to be and Saul sought him every single day by the way Saul didn't seek him alone Saul sought him with an army Saul tried to catch him with spies Saul had all the resources uh, at his disposal and yet he could not catch him Because God delivered him not into his hand. Well, now fast forward to 1 Samuel chapter 27. And in verse number 1. And this may be perhaps 10 years of David running from Saul. But let me also remind you that in those 10 years, Saul sought David just about every day but he couldn't get his hands on him. On the contrary, we know of at least two times that David had the opportunity to kill Saul. One time when they were in En Gedi, in those caves there. The Bible says that David and his men were hiding in the cave, and in walked Saul all by himself to relieve himself. And, of course, David's men said, there's Saul, go get him. And David, uh, when you read about the exploits of David and his mighty men, not to disrespect any of our, any military today, but I, I think David was part ninja. I think he was part martial arts artist. He was amazing because in that time while they were in there, somehow David with all the stealth was able to sneak up on Saul and cut off his coat to the point David or Saul didn't even realize it. And he brought it back to his guys and he said, I'm feeling guilty for this because I've been instructed not to put my hand on the Lord's anointed. And Saul walked out of the cave, and once he got down, and by the way, if you've ever been in to En Gedi, you wait till he gets down, and the caves are way up in the cliffs. And David looked down at Saul, and he said, uh, and he called to him, and Saul looked back. And then pretty much what David said is, look at your coat. (laughs) And half of it was missing. David said, I could have killed you, but I didn't. You know that that happened? The Bible records on two occasions. In 10 years, it might have been more occasions than that. But in all that time, with all his resources, Saul was never able to get a hold of David because he was in God's will. He was where he was supposed to be. And no harm had come to his men. They had other exploits in Mount Carmel, and and no men, no harm had come to his men. It was amazing. It was as if this, this spiritual bubble was around David and his men, and they could do no wrong, as long as they were where God wanted them to be. But now we come to 1 Samuel chapter 27, and in verse number 1, after all of this, and David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me, to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. 
Now it seems like the right thing to do. He's been running for over a decade. Unless you consider, A, God told him not to go there, and B, yeah, this educational part of David's life was rough. But there had been miracle after miracle after miracle, deliverance after deliverance after deliverance. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse number 1, is what gets David to Ziklag. Because then they go to the Philistines, and they're given this city, and all seems well. Till we come to 1 Samuel chapter 30, and then... In verse number one, when it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. You know, there may have been a reason God did not want David to settle down. Because when he did, he became a target. His children became a target. His wives became a target. And perhaps in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and in verse number 4, David is weeping for a different reason than everyone else. David is realizing, I listened to my heart. And in listening to my heart, I I defied the word of God. The word of God which came unto me and said, be over here. But I said, that's not a good place for me to be. So I'm going to go over here. Listen, this can happen in your moral life. This can happen in your thought life. This can happen in your emotional life. This can happen in your physical life. You ought to be where God wants you to be. Always. And if you're not sure, the Bible says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally. Be where God wants you to be, that your joy may be full. So the situation was self-induced. And David probably weeping harder than anyone else because he realized, This is all my doing. But aren't you glad that God is, aren't you glad God is gracious? Even when it is your own doing, God is plenteous in mercy. And his mercy endures forever. And he is like the father of the prodigal son, waiting for us to come back to him. And as soon as we do, he's there to receive us with kisses, with a ring, with a robe, and with a wonderful position. Because our God is gracious. Not only do we see in the situation that it was self-induced, it was also, uh, it was also sadly ironic. David left the promised land for safety and found just the opposite. You know that people leave the will of God for happiness to find just the opposite. People leave the will of God for freedom to find they become slaves to sin. How many times have we seen Christians leave God's will for a better life and find just the opposite? I know I've shared this with you many times before, but I can remember when when we lived in California that the challenge was keeping people because everybody wanted to move to greener pastures. Well, you know, California, it's not a very good place to raise children and not a good place to raise kids. And it's very, very expensive. And so people were always trying to move to Nevada or trying to move to Idaho or, or move to Oregon or, or someplace like that. And rather than seeking God's will, we're just seeking a better life. And they would never find it. Oh, they might find a bigger house. They might find more property. They might find all those things, but they also found that there are challenges to being outside of God's will that we cannot overcome. And how many times we have seen Christians leave God's will for, quote, a better life. 
Hey, ask Naomi, who in the book of Ruth, the Bible says that her and her husband and her two sons left the promised land because there was a famine, left the promised land because of high unemployment, left the promised land because it was a tough place to raise kids. They, they left the promised land because there just wasn't anything available. And so they left the promised land to go to another place. And they did find employment. They did find a house. They did find food. But it, was long, it wasn't long till after they lived there. The Bible says that the husband died. Oh, another thing that the two boys found, they found wives. But it wasn't too long, and they died also. And so Naomi, who had left with her family to go to a better place outside of God's will, found that she left a place that caused happiness to go to a place where she'd become extremely bitter. And of course, that is what she get. Outside of God's will. The situation self-induced. The situation sadly ironic. We either reject God or we leave God because we think it's better for us. And hey, if I had the ability, I could have a parade up here on this platform of people who have left God's will, who today, their lives are in tatters. Some are dead. Some's families have been completely broken up. Some whose health has gone awry. I have seen the book of Ruth over and over and over again in my own ministry. A lot of times our situation is self-induced. A lot of times it is sadly ironic. Because God knows what's best. Listen, God's no, God knows not only today and the here and now. God knows what caused yesterday. And he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Not written for our entertainment, though... At times, extremely entertaining. Read the book of uh, Esther. Very entertaining book. And talk about a book with fairy tale ending and they lived happily ever after. Man, that's the book of Esther. I think every fairy tale is based on the book of Esther. Very entertaining. But that was not its purpose. Nor is it the purpose of the word of God. As a matter of fact, we are told that the purpose of the word of God is not only to give us life, but to give us life more abundantly, that our joy may be full. You want your joy to be full this morning? Don't listen to your heart. It'll lie to you. It'll deceive you. Not on purpose. It's just that your heart is so finite and so in the present, it can't see tomorrow. Whereas our God is a master of it all. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. With every head bowed and with every eye closed. And I know...